Thank you for joining us. We will begin in three minutes. Thank you for joining us. We will begin in one minute. Good evening, and thank you for joining us this evening for the Female Power Her. See what we did there in planning. I'm Raquel Asa with BEEP, an autonomous solutions provider located right here in Lake Nona, an advanced district within the city of Orlando. On behalf of the Central Florida chapter of the American Planning Association, the Suncoast Section APA, Florida chapter, APA Florida Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee, the APA Florida Orlando Metro Session, APA Florida OMS Women in Planning Group. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this virtual event as we close out the most amazing month of the year, Women's History Month. The AICPCM credit number for today's session, please take note of this. It's also on your screen right now. It is right there at the blue bar. Today's uh, IC, I, AICP. CPCM credit number is 9232510. So this evening, you'll actually have the opportunity here from a fantastic panel of women. We're going to have a panel full of uh, fantastic women, each weighing in in their own specialty. So you'll hear from Lori Cox with the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council, Heather Crony with the City of Eustis, Cheryl Morante with the West Palm Beach downtown, and Emily Hanna with Bike Walk Central Florida. This session will set the stage by introducing some background on Women's History Month, followed by census data and population projections, then dive into salary survey data. The discussions will then move into the experiences, journey, and challenges of being a manager and a leader of a growing organization while juggling many tasks personally and, quite frankly, professionally, which is always a challenge. Finally, suggestions will be offered for balancing the demands of your professional environment and prioritizing self-care, which is very important these days. Now, the goal here is to discuss women's place now and previously in history, in addition to the burden of labor on women and the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on women. 
It is important to consider all people and their needs when designing spaces and communities. People, place, prosperity will be the themes of focus for this event tonight, as well as solutions on how we can help and support absolutely everyone, no matter their gender, to their best of their ability. To kick things off this evening, we're going to start with Heather Crony on the topic of breaking the salary barrier, how to get what you want. Good evening, everyone. I am Heather Crony. I am currently serving as a senior planner for the city of Eustis. And tonight I am bringing you information on salaries from women and just overall how women compare and add up amongst others. And particularly some information from an APA salary survey that was done a few years ago. Uh, next slide, please. So here you can see that earlier on in age, um, there's when women are younger, there's less of a gap in the differences in salaries between men and women. But as you progress through life, that gap actually gets bigger and you can see more of a difference in the positions that um, positions and salaries that men and women hold. Um, this is Per, potentially from different um, reasons or causes, um, which we can get into that a little bit later on. I know some things Lori will talk about will touch on kind of how women have different life needs and experiences. Um, perhaps they're not able to at some point have such a high job or management sort of title as men because we are the ones who can bring new life into the world, which is a gift, but also people tend to look at that as a drawback or negative. Um, next slide, please. So you might be thinking there are so many factors, as I was mentioning, like profession, experience, you name it, could go on for a while. Um, so let's dive deeper. Uh, so many women, especially women, sorry, so many people, especially women, say only a matter of time, the gap will close. Um, this is only so true and really the time will tell as to where that goes and we can be the ones to try to make that difference. We have to fight for what we feel we're deserving of. And you can see in this chart here, uh, women through the 60s, 70s, and 80s have progressed since then. Women have gotten, though, complacent um, with lots of discussion on racial wage differences. Oftentimes, the pay differences, male versus female, tend to get overlooked. So this slide here is showing from all over different industries, all workers in the United States. Um, this is showing from 1960 to 2015. And women and men meet annual earnings, full-time year-round workers. Next slide. So when looking at different information on salaries, we definitely want to pay attention to the source limitations of it. So with information, say from the APA salary survey, this doesn't give us a full and complete picture because actually only a quarter of all APA members responded to the survey. Um, there's about 10,000 members who took the survey out of approximately 40,000 members. So this data is only part of the story. It only tells us so much. Uh, we also have to consider the work-life balance, different choices people make, where they choose to prioritize their career, job, um, family, how they choose to make that balance happen or does it maybe not happen? Next slide. 
So here you can see, as I know Emily will talk about later on, um, the difference in planning of it being a majority men and being less women. Um, so 42% of the respondents in 2016 were women. And that is up for, yeah, that is up from 34% in 2004. So there is progress being made as far as there becoming a greater mixture of the different genders in the field. Um, so we started big in general in the earlier data you saw here. Now we're narrowing down to specifically planners here. Um, even in 2018 here, the majority of planners are men. Now, four years later, currently in 2022, perhaps that has changed. Um, different data could really give us a better idea on that, but um, most recent I have here is 2018. Next slide. So in this table here, you can see just the difference back in the 1970s, the later 1970s and the early 1980s, the difference in the median salaries for planners comparing male to female. So 82 cents on the dollar, then 84 cents on the dollar difference. Um, in the 80s, women started out as a planner one and men often started out as a planner two. So just in the kind of positions that it's seen that men versus women can obtain, it makes a difference in what their earning potential can be and um, just where they can possibly go from there. And I imagine as well the then um, training, experience, education opportunities. Nowadays, I think we're evening out, but some many years ago, it was a lot more of a difference. Next slide. This is just showing that comparison um, from the planners who took the salary survey. 34% were women. Women made 80 cents, 86 cents on the dollar versus men. Um, only 34% of the respondents were women. So it could have been um, only that many took the survey, or maybe there's only about that many in the field, possibly a combination. Next slide. And then moving up to 2018, that previous slide was from 2004. Um, so in 40 years, we have decreased the wage gap from 82 cents on the dollar to 89 cents on the um, Fast forward to 2018, women make 89 cents on the dollar. Decrease wage gap by three cents on the dollar. So that is certainly some progress in 40 years, but we definitely have still more progress to make. Next slide. Here you can see a comparison of median wages, 2006 versus 2018. Female is shown with the light blue, male is shown with the gray, and it's showing years of experience. So good news is average wages are increasing. The gap is pretty small or non-existent for less than 10 years experiences, or sorry, less than 10 years of experience. And wages are increasing Bad news is average wages are not increasing as quickly for women as for men. 22,800 between 2006 and 2018 for men and 21,900 for women. The gap is pretty big for 20 plus years of experience, almost $8,000 per year. Over 20 years, that comes up to about $150,000. So it may not seem like much at a glimpse, but it's on the longer period. Next slide. So 
So if we really want to achieve pay equity, we need to set goals as we grow and our experience. We need to have the courage to talk about it, both with women and men. It's never an easy thing to talk about how much you make, your earnings, how much you deserve, and really be your own cheerleader. When it comes down to it, typically nobody else is going to be that person to cheer you on and make the point of your worth. And uh, so parity will not achieve parity unless we are willing to wait decades. Parity is a state or condition of being equal, especially regarding your status or pay. At the rate that things have been in past, um, past data, to have as many women that are FAICP as men that are FAICP. A lot more women recently becoming FAICP and I think that is thing efforts from certain especially divisions of APA and the different sections trying to make sure that they are awarding FAICP to those who are in, you know different genders different races etc next slide So what does the research say? Men are typically much more likely than women to negotiate salary. When women do negotiate, women are less likely to perceive situations as negotiable and have it. Women negotiate just as frequently, but are less likely to achieve success. During how I approach this sort of situation to um, say how my husband does. He's much more headstrong with it. He doesn't take as easily for an answer. Whereas I know I and then other women that I know of, we're much more likely to back down and let ourselves be discouraged by others. But change. Next slide. So why is this? Some possibilities as to why um, gender roles, um, stereotypes, and ex expectations that influence that others have. Um, often the undervaluing contribution expectations, as well as the fear of repercussions or damage to relationships. The fear of being told no and essentially getting punished for even asking for and pushing to have more value given to you. Um, I know I've seen all of these in myself and others. Next slide. Negotiation really does and can pay. You can get a great return on investment for even a small one-time negotiation. If it's a $5,000 difference, that can in the long run equal a $750,000 up over time. A woman who routinely negotiates her salary will amass over a million dollars more over the course of her lifetime. Takeaway on this, it's worth it. We need to fight for what we want, what we deserve. Next slide. It's most effective. Research does suggest a blend of assertiveness and a collaborative style. You have to know your aim high, prepare, and practice. Um, aim higher than what your target actually is. For when there is the negotiation, you're being knocked down less. Develop, develop assertiveness skills if you tend to defer. Work on minimizing, hedging, and other sort of techniques to, um, uh, sorry, minimizing, hedging, and other You need to strengthen your own position prior to negotiation. And these are things that I Emily is going to talk on and um, 
I can see her, you know, as one that she does these things and I'm sure it works because of where she is today. <laughs> Let me just say, next slide. So research suggests, oops, sorry. Um, yes, um, research does suggest a blend of assertiveness and a collaborative style, as we were saying. You wanna keep that friendly and cooperative style. Um, strive to understand, be intra-based, interest-based, and show the benefit to the other party. When doing negotiating, negotiating um, tell them what the benefit is in them, say for retaining you or what you can do for them, should they value you with pay and or perhaps skills or other ways that they're working for you and with you. Just as you need the benefits that they're giving to you. Next slide. So research um, sources, anything you may um, want to look up further about this, um, take this little link and definitely check out Ask For It by Babcock and Lashiver. And I can put this in the chat so that if anybody wants to check it out further, you can more easily do so. And that's all I have, turning it over now to our next person, Emily. Thank you, Heather. That was fantastic. Great introduction into uh, planning female her power as Raquel kind of introduced to the topic. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Hanna. I am the current executive director of Bike Walk Central Florida. We are an advocacy organization here in Central Florida advocating for pedestrian, bicycle, and trail infrastructure, safety, policy, uh, you name it. We don't do a very good job of it here in Central Florida. So my job is to work with partners um, across kind of our region uh, to improve pedestrian and bicycle connection and safety. Um, but before I jump into that, uh, Heather kind of um, alluded to um, some assertiveness that I've had in my career that has allowed me at such a young age to, to work my way up through the um, hierarchy, if you will, in a typical planning firm, planning uh, community. Um, and then seek outside employment, seek other employment that really aligned with my personal um, kind of interests and um, aligned with a balance, a healthier work-life balance. So I wanna talk about that a little bit today. Um, but prior to my role at Bike Walk, I was the um, uh, development services manager of the city of Castleberry. And prior to that, I was an Orange County staffer in their neighborhood services division, just a, a number and a name in a big wheel. And I will talk a little bit about those experiences in kind of my, my discussion. But today, what I really want to do is, is start by kind of reading my bio and who I am. Um, and so as the executive director or and or the development services manager for Castleberry, um, I worked very closely with developers in building a relationship with them to get the work that we needed to do done in the city and do it effectively in so much so that in 2019, I won the Orlando Business Journal's 40 Under 40 Award, um, which at that time, local planners from a small city really didn't receive that kind of feedback, that kind of limelight. Um, but because of the work we did in Castleberry and the policies that we were able to change, um, we were able to, um, I was able to, to win that award. Besides that, besides working for Bike Walk full time, I am an adjunct professor at UCF. I teach two different classes, urban and regional planning and land use and planning in the political administration uh, program at the downtown campus. Um, and when I'm not teaching at UCF or working full-time at Bike Walk. Um, I serve on five different advisory boards pretty actively. If and those of you that know me and know my role in the boards, I don't just join them as a, um, a resume builder. I don't need that. I want to actually give back to my community. So not only do I serve as the 
um, vice president of the Orlando Metro section of APA, which is um, one of the uh, sponsors for today's event, but also the president of the Central Florida Florida Planning and Zoning Chapter. Um, I'm also the vice chair of the Seminole County Parks and Preservation Advisory Committee, the Parks and Rec Committee, if you will. Um, and I also serve on a few other advisory boards like UCF, the uh, Florida Greenways and Trails Foundation, so on and so forth. Um, some of you might know me from my work at this at UCF um, when I was in a master's program at UCF and my master's from urban regional planning from there. Um, I started the urban nights planning student organization um, and part of that work and part of starting that work that that um, planning organization for the school was kind of what set me up essentially for success in my career so I, I will talk about that. But first and foremost, I have some fun pictures that I kind of wanted to go over first, because it sounds like from my bio that that's all I do is work, work, work. But that's not actually the case. I do have a lot of fun. And for those that do follow me on social media, that's all I post is all the fun stuff, right? All the pictures of all my travels and all the things that I do. So I wanted to dive into that just to explain that work-life balance. So when I'm not at community events, uh, like the Bike to Work Day at City of Orlando last Friday, or in the evening doing public presentations, resolutions, like I was at the town of Oakland for a project we're working on with the Foundation for a Healthier West Orange County, I also travel regularly, um, and I'll talk about why my travels, why I incorporate that, and think of it also as work. Think of it as engagement when I'm out kind of exploring in that community. Uh, so the photo here is me pointing to Half Dome, uh, which is a, um, a really difficult hike in Yosemite. I highly recommend, if you're not familiar with Half Dome, to look it up. Uh, it requires cables. Um, and it's about a, um, an almost a 90 degree incline that you have to literally pull yourself up to get over this giant rock, which is Half Dome. Um, so I'm going to talk about that today because that is going to be a symbol of planning, women in planning, kind of continuing to put their, their, their next step forward and continuing to repel themselves up this big rock that essentially we're trying to get to equity for our planning profession. When I'm not hiking and exploring and traveling, I show horses competitively. I have three. Um, I keep them at home. I have to take care of them on a regular basis. They are my children because I don't have that. So, um, so I spend a lot of time catering to them and um, I compete with them on a regular basis. I'm constantly traveling to horse shows as well. So now that I've described kind of those photos, when do I work? How do I have all of this fun, uh, fun activities that I do and how do I balance that with work? And that's really what I'm going to talk about. So I, I wanted to kind of say that I do a lot professionally, but I also do a lot personally. And I hope that the tips and tricks that I'm going to give you today help you balance that as well. Um, so Amy, next slide, please. Thank you. So I just have some tips and tricks. This is, I'm going to start off this slide. This is the professional tips and tricks. And obviously this is going to, going to kind of go over to the personal side, but I want to start with some of my experiences as I built up my uh, resume and my experience very quickly with Orange County and the city of Castleberry. First and foremost is know your audience. I was always really well prepared as a baby planner, as I like to call it, planner one entering into the field. I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew that in order for me to gain any type of respect in the work field and in, in the workforce, I needed to know what my job was. And I needed to know the code and the rules in which I could make decisions like the back of my hand. But of course, that's easier said than done, especially with if you're inundated with a lot of work, backlog especially, uh, you don't always have the time to sit down and study that code. Um, so I would siphon off um, an hour or so a day of my schedule, sometimes even in the evenings outside of work, just so that I could get myself prepared and know the code really well. Because as a baby planner in the city of Casper, I wasn't going to get any respect from any of the male developers that were in the room, any of the male public works officials or water resource people or law enforcement or fire department, because we know through the development review committee that all of these really male dominated fields sit here and they get to design and dictate how we build our built environment. And so I came in with this understanding of well, these guys know their code really well and can negotiate that code within the different players. Why can't I? Why can't my voice be just as prominent as some of those males that have had 20 years experience? I don't need the experience to know that that's what the code says. And I can bring that information. I can bring that wealth of knowledge to those meetings. So always be prepared. 
my favorite little story is I was prepared for my first development review committee at the city of Castleberry. It was the city center project. We had uh, mixed use development. It was a private public partnership with um, a residential developer and a commercial developer and the city. So it was just all kinds of crazy. Um, we were, we came into DRC, the elevations for the project looked like student housing. And I knew what student housing looked like because I had just graduated from UCF. I took pictures of it and I said, developer, A, this is your project and here's student housing. It looks really identical. It doesn't meet any of the code criteria either. So I, I laid it out for him. And he was incredibly offended. Uh, first DRC meeting, right? Never done this before. I offended this developer out of the gate. And I said, I'm sorry, but that is my professional opinion. And I, I stood by that. Now, what I didn't know was that the city manager and the mayor of the city at the time, because I hadn't met them yet. This is like day three on the job were in the audience and they were so impressed by my ability to stand up to the man um, who was essentially coming in and kind of railroading this project for the city. And so by me standing up and saying my opinion, even though it wasn't code, I, I pointed to some code sources later on that obviously showed them that their articulation wasn't what we required, the opacity of the building wasn't what we required. But generally speaking, I made that comment and it lit the room up. And we were able to have a dialogue because I was not afraid to state my opinion. And I used the expertise that I had gotten from school to stand behind my comment. And I didn't waver. I didn't back down. Even after he told me he was offended, I was like, well, I'm sorry, but it's true. Um, and, I, and I wasn't afraid to, to talk that talk to them and to have those conversations. More recently, um, being in a bike walk role, um, I have never had to negotiate with a railroad before. And I've got a project where I have to go in and negotiate with a railroad. Uh, for a trail crossing, right? Which is like, you know, that's like oil and water. Um, but I went in because I, I went into the meeting pretty successfully because I knew what the railroad wanted. I knew the rules. I looked at the Florida Administrative Code. I knew what type of crossings were allowed where and what the rules were for that. I came into that meeting educated. And I also came into that meeting knowing what my audience wanted. I knew who their partners were. I knew who their businesses were. I did all of the research necessary so that they couldn't tell me no. They told me maybe, which was way better than a no, but no didn't stop me and wasn't going to stop me. But at least I got to maybe, and I got to maybe initially instead of having and wasting a lot of time, energy, and effort to go from no to maybe. I'm going to stop there and pause and say that there is never no, I never take no as the final answer. I take no for right now. It doesn't mean no later. It might just not be the, um, the, right, the right product, the right people, the right political, it's not, it might not be the right time, but don't ever give up on that. And that's one thing that I've been pretty, pretty good at is never not fighting for what I believe is the right thing specific to our built environment. Um, the next thing is walk the walk. If you're going to be about urban planning and you're going to be about doing these designs and doing this, then make sure that you, you support all of the things that you need. If you're going to write a policy or you're going to stand up to your commission and say, no, this is good urban planning practices, then explain why. Show them examples. Not only show them how the policy is implemented, but also show them how even, even local cities do it. And I know a lot of local planners do compare and contrast. And I know in school, we're taught not to steal. But essentially, what other people are doing is OK. And it's OK for you to say, I am a professional. I have my master's degree. I have an AICP designation. I do know kind of what I'm talking about. So come with to that conversation with that confidence that you do know what you're talking about, because I promise you that's half the battle of getting people to convince that you are right. It's coming in knowing that you are right, right? Um, for example, the other thing I want to talk about about walk the walk, and this is more being a manager, not necessarily being a staffer. Um, but when I took over for bike walk and became their executive director, we didn't have staff. I was it. So we brought on staff. Um, I didn't have an HR department. I was HR. I'm risk management. I'm IT. I'm everything, which is a lot of fun. I don't, I don't recommend it, but I've grown staff now. But I had to learn about how to grow staff. And I had to learn about how to support my staff and get what they needed from my board or from other resources or other vendors. So not only did I walk the walk when it came to policy, but I also would always support my staff, even at Castleberry, even though I didn't have quite control over that, but I would try to get them the resources that they need. If they needed research and they needed time, then I would get them what they needed. So always make sure to walk the walk and have that confidence that it, it, you know what you're talking about when you walk into that room. 
And then of course, don't be afraid to speak up. Uh, my example at the uh, DRC meeting with the crappy elevation was a great example. I wasn't afraid. I stood by my opinion. It might not, not have been the developer's favorite thing, but come to find out years later, Everybody at that table wanted somebody to say it, but nobody had, excuse me, the cojones, the balls to say it. And I'm sorry that I've got to be the only female in the room that can actually be the one that, that says this to the developer. Um, so don't be afraid. Know that you, that's probably what other people are thinking. That's, you know, that's the right direction for your community, for, for what your commission, what your, your community really wants. So don't be afraid to stand up for that. And don't be afraid to speak up about it either. You might be, be told, no, nah, that doesn't work, but at least they know that you're listening and they know that you're actively paying attention and you are thinking of other ways kind of to, to change the conversation, to change that dialogue. Another great example of this is um, when I worked at the city, I wrote a medical marijuana ordinance and then wrote it again and then wrote it again because I love the state statutes and all their changes. So one of the changes that they made was to pretty much eliminate, right? You either ban medical marijuana outright or you allow it like a pharmacy. And so we went in and we actually, I asked the attorney and shopped this around. I actually changed the definition of a pharmacy in our code so that we could restrict the location for medical marijuana dispensaries without having to restrict necessarily or limit them or ban them altogether. Thank you, Amy. I'm running way behind. Um, test the waters. And that's another example with the medical marijuana. I went to the attorney and I was like, can we do this or not? I tested the waters. We ended up having one of the best medical marijuana pollen ordinances written that we went on a uh, tour essentially um, across the state of Florida with that medical marijuana ordinance uh, defining pharmacies as a best practice tool because no one had thought about defining it like that before. Uh, I have that example if you do need a medical marijuana ordinance. Um, and then always smile. Um, one of my greatest examples of, I was managing the building department at the time and planners we don't know building stuff that's a whole separate code we got to learn kind of a little bit but I had to completely learn a whole new section of code and so I was struggling with understanding a specific building code section that had to do with a private building permit for this woman that was trying to do an addition to her house and she came in at the wrong time and I was beat I was exhausted it was 5 55 the city closed at 6 I was like, ma'am, I cannot help you. And she was like, I'm, I just need to fix this. This is, you know, X, Y, and Z. So I stopped and I thought from her perspective, I put a smile on my face and I did what I could for her at that point in time. The city had closed. I still helped her, sent her on her way, whatever. Um, a week or so later, she sent um, a goodie basket to our staff for us basically taking the time to work with her. And she made a point to say, thank you, Emily, for smiling. She said, I was devastated and beat as well. And I, I was sure that you were going to turn me away, but you smiled at me and you made me feel warm and you welcomed me into the city. Um, and that went on to get applause from the city commission and the mayor and managers because they were all sent that same email. So even if you feel defeated, even if you feel like, oh my God, I can't do another fence permit, smile because you don't know what the other person on the other side of that wall is thinking or what they're going through, or what they're feeling. We as females can do that pretty easily, males not so much, and I found that pretty common. So I highly recommend that you always continue to just smile, be, be happy. Next slide, please. And I promise I will go fast with the second slide. Um, since I only have a minute left. So personal work-life balance. Like I said, I do a lot of things personally, but I also do a lot of stuff professionally. So how do I balance that both? Well, always put you first. No one else is gonna do you, you have to do you. And so take that time. Um, I have a, a, a calendar in which I manage pretty regularly and I make sure to schedule my time first before I put any work-related stuff in there. I make sure to get my, my 40 hours or what, whatever I need to work, right, that the minimum. Um, but I, I always make sure to prioritize the things that I need to do for myself first. I am lucky that I have that flexibility. Not everybody does, but try to prioritize yourself. Um, and remember your why. Why are you passionate about planning? Why did you get into it in the first place? Remember why you do the work. And that will hopefully put a smile on your face and not only help you professionally, but also personally and help you be a little more jovial about having to grudge through some of the professional stuff in order to achieve that, that personal life balance. 
I make a schedule. Um, this was something I learned from the seven habits of a, um, a highly effective person is block scheduling. Um, so I schedule personal things. I schedule work. I schedule when I have meetings. I schedule when I drive. I schedule when I brush my teeth. Like I literally schedule everything and I stick with it. So not only do my staff know where I'm going to be on a regular basis, but I know what and how I'm going to manage that. And I use that block scheduling with color codes and different um, marker demarcation to help me stay organized. If it's something that I can bump, if it's personal or work related that I can't get to because something's on fire, then that's fine. I can bump it. I give myself a lot of detail and I give myself a lot of time in order to achieve those tasks in that schedule format. And then always continue to grow. I initiated, initially said in the um, first part of this that um, that I travel all the time and I travel in all, and I look at it from a professional growing pers perspective. I look at the opportunity to, um, to, to go out West and say, how does California build sidewalks and trails? I might be traveling and hiking in Yosemite for the weekend, but I'm looking at how their signage relates to, um, how, how do they have ADA access? Like I'm constantly thinking and taking back ideas of things that are done on, while I'm on vacation. And typically what I do is I do a little write up and I bring that back to my staff or my work. And I said, this is what I learned. And here's some new things that we can take away from this. I was in Colorado recently, saw some state road signs that were warning pedestrians and state law. And I thought that those were really great. So I snapped a photo and I texted my contact at FDOT here in District 5. And she's like, I love these. Let's see if we've got these in the MUTCD. We did. Now we can place them. So now FDOT is looking at a place to locate those types of yield signs. So just because you're on vacation doesn't mean that you can't continue to grow. You can't continue to look at things. And I know every single woman on this call probably goes to a city and is like, how do we achieve this in my, where I live, right? We all do that. We can't help it, but continue to use that to your advantage, almost as a, as a work-life balance. Also use your vacations that way. Take a little bit of time to do some work if your employer allows it. I do um, as bike walk, I get to kind of decide those rules and make those rules. So I encourage my staff to go out and experience new trails, new built facilities, new types of crossings when they're out traveling. And I give them time back for vacation because they are are taking and bringing that back to the organization. And it makes them happy too, because now not only are they going on vacation and getting that respite, but they're getting great ideas to bring back for us to do here. And so I, I truly try to support that. That is a little different type of manager thinking. Um, and that comes from a traditionalist, or I'm sorry, a transformational type of manager role. Um, I highly recommend if you're interested in some of those that you look up the CPM program. Thank you, Amy, I'm sorry. Um, the CPM is the Certified Public Manager. They teach you the difference between traditional management and transformational management and how to get your staff to grow and think outside the box and, and do more with less. So I highly recommend if you're interested in that, that is run by Florida State. Last but not least, don't stop believing in the work that you're doing and in yourself. Because at the end of the day, only you are going to be able to achieve the work that you want to get done. Only you are going to be able to prioritize the work in your community, in your profession, and in your personal life. So if you believe that you have a mission and a vision and you want to complete that, then do it. And don't take no for an answer. No is just a maybe not right now, but no is not no forever. So I apologize for going over. Um, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, sorry, I'm just about to get control over the PowerPoint. Um, my name is Sho Muriente and I am the West Palm Beach Downtown Development Authority's uh, Public Realm Director. I design and implement and manage new placemaking programs and projects for public spaces, um, basically to further enhance the quality of life for people that live and work there. Um, but today I will be talking about how certain significant projects allow me to transform and apply both the theories of urban acupuncture and the archaeology of local knowledge into my work. Um, this has allowed me to create an alternative career within the field of planning and also city building. So, you know, a bit of my background is in art and architecture and urban planning. 
Um, in 2010, I began um, actually teaching creative placemaking. And through the research, I created this philosophy um, that, you know, let's break boundaries in the field of human built environment. Um, seeing that actually urban planning and architecture was so um, kind of male oriented, I started to understand like, what if I studied a bit of sociology, anthropology, and cultural theory to better understand cities and how they work and how we can make it better for people. Um, in terms of placemaking, um, I wanna say, you know, there are many ways of defining it, but in my own words, it's really the act of taking a design space and activating it with the actual community. So, you know, in the travels, a lot of the places I went to, this was like a recurring theme. Uh, people always said, um, the city, you know, they, they're passive, they don't care. Um, and then from the part of the people, they would say, well, the municipality doesn't want to help us. They really don't care about us either. Um, it made it feel like there are many siloed conversations, but not really a lot of dialogue between the two sides. Um, so many people uh, might have had good ideas, sorry. Um, but maybe the money was not attached to the ideas or the spaces to the money and so on. And so with this approach um, of urban acupuncture and the archaeology of local knowledge, um, it can be seen sometimes as a softer way of city planning, um, you know, way of actually doing things bottoms up. And in this case, um, we are not the ar star architect anymore or the master planner. We're actually not even the experts when we use this theory. Um, so it's a lot about listening to the community's input and then finding that high frequency of what the community wants and what they need so that we can make these smaller acupuncture points in the city and plant some seeds in them and make them work. Um, so, you know, we kind of listen in, put them in place, and then see what direction they take. Um, but ideally, you know, it comes down to dividing um, or taking down, breaking down the idea of us versus them, and actually empowering um, people and spreading the resources uh, throughout a community by providing opportunities of stewardship and governance in cities. So, you know, as I went through um, different parts of the world to do this work uh, prior to landing in downtown West Palm, um, I kept feeling that everywhere I went, you know, it's really like all places have people in them. That's the basics. Um, this process can be applied anywhere. Um, it always provides a different result as it's contextually appropriate to the place and the people. So in 2013, um, La Mastra was actually a project, I call it also the bread story, that was produced and filmed in Artena, Italy. Um, this is really a place that is 30 kilometers southeast of Rome. It's a village that exists on top of a mountain. Um, and along with me, uh, the Ruin Academy and the International Society of Biurbanism and a group of students spent two weeks in this village identifying, creating urban acupuncture interventions with the community. Um, my project um, in this village, the idea was to retell a story of how communal bread was made in the village of Artena in the late 60s. Um, and while unearthing this local history of place through an exchange with the local nonas or grannies, um, we were able to restore an old piece of furniture used solely for kneading the storage of dough um, in, in, in exchange to learning what's going on in this place and telling this story publicly. So the way, um, you know, backing up a little bit on the urban acupuncture and, and what the archeology span of local knowledge means. Um, so the urban acupuncture are these small scale, into, scale interventions that serve as a catalyst so that either social or physical changes can radiate and transform the larger urban context. And in terms of um, trying to like unearth information or the local knowledge, um, we try to find things in maps and, and actually take the stories and map them out so that we can understand the identity of the community in place. Um, 
So here is kind of like the theory in, or the methodology in practice. Um, there will always be an exchange of, of doing something for the community uh, and almost like teaching them who they are as us being a reflection or a mirror for them to see themselves in it. Uh, so most of the time when we do activations, it's very important to put them out in public space. Um, it can get a little messy. And part of it is to actually get people to come in and collaborate. So as we are um, you know, restoring this um, red uh, table, let's put it this way, um, you can start seeing that people are coming out and actually talking to other grandmothers and you have the youth um, collecting um, more information and, and understanding that in this story, there were uh, 200 families in this town. Uh, the dough would get cooked communally in four uh, large ovens. And then they uh, would retell this story to people who didn't know and knew people that were living there. Um, so part of expanding um, this knowledge, you know, we, we then make the bread together. Uh, we film this. And at this point um, in the project, I'm not sure if the urban acupuncture is actually going to work or not. And what's interesting about this is that most of the projects um, in this case, it was a very matriarch project. Um, the grandmothers just took over and baked the bread, came out, and we shared it together. Um, we film all this and put it back out as a documentary so that they have something that they're proud of um, in terms of their identity and their history of place. Um, and again, these are just some of the stills from the film uh, Regeneration City. Um, in the end, what's interesting about this particular project as well is that the grandmothers were able to transfer the knowledge to the younger uh, generation, and they actually took their yeast and decided to create a beer for the local place and sell it in Rome. So out of these, let's say, like soft storytelling processes, we actually got an economic, uh, almost economic development project based on creating this byproduct that identifies that town in now Rome. Um, and then bringing that knowledge of Europe to the United States, you know, you would ask like, so how would that work here? We have so many rules and regulations and um, we take the same process and we applied it to the alleyways in um, downtown West Palm Beach through a project called Celavia. Um, so this is what it looked like back in um, 20, I want to say 2014, um, we, you know, were going downtown uh, with the local DDA and also students as well from FAU. And um, we're putting these open forums together in the city. So um, this is just a gallery space that we asked permission to occupy. And we would ask the same questions we did also in Italy. Uh, but again, in this um, new you know, environment. We would walk the space with everyone, ask them what their gut reaction was to place. Again, these are very like soft and um, I guess feelings that, you know, what is your feeling of the place? And we had everybody like jot down by different urban categories, what they wish they would see different. What would they dream their dreams be? What would they need or want to be done in this space? So after power washing the place at 4 a.m. in the morning with a group of people, uh, we redecorated the space and did a one-to-one -one scale, uh, let's say urban maquette to showcase what could actually happen there. Um, so this uh, actual intervention is very interesting. Uh, you start getting all sorts of groups of people. Um, this is the actual crew that uh, were a mixture of community champions, students, artists, merchants, um, you name it, everybody that was surrounded that alleyway, um, it had a very bad history. And we were trying to rethink and re-memorize for people to think of this place as a different uh, place for them to occupy. So even bands played in the back next to the dumpsters. And what's interesting about this is, um, in an alley that you had people actually not wanting to walk through it because there had been um, terrible things happening there at night. Um, we had 440 people show up that day in 10 hours of time. 
Um, we always measure everything. So even though that these projects are made with a lot of, let's say, feelings and how we feel about how to make place better, um, we do observational research. We turn this into hard data and present it back to the city. And inside the presentation, what was interesting is even though this was a pop-up and it was so soft and it just disappeared after 10 hours of being there, um, we always video, this will live forever. And we asked them to add this to the capital improvement budget. Back then I did not work for, this, uh, for the DDA. I was actually a, a teacher back then and just a person living in my city. And as an activist, um, they did allocate the money and they started actually changing the, the alleyways into built, better built places. And this is an example. Here, here's how the alleyway looks today, uh, repaved. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of improvements done. And uh, fast forward to um, 2021, March of 2021, uh, we did our first uh, bilingual activation in the alleyway, uh, bringing out a local merchant next door um, that has a Colombian coffee shop and just, again, bringing people together into the actual space um, to activate it with the community, making then a place out of it. Uh, so even when we as planners are fixing streets and alleys and just, you know, sidewalks, et cetera, it really doesn't have the same um, interaction or usage unless you bring people in. And I guess um, from my female perspective as a planner, that's what I bring into this career is how do we listen and understand, you know, what we can nurture and grow in a place by just inviting people and making it their place um, by also bringing, you know, my ego down and saying, I'm not the master planner, they are the masters of the place. Uh, so as you can see here, local bands playing in the alleyway, um, again, artists showing up and showing their work in a very informal way um, and also doing uh, expressions of culture. Um, this is very important for our cities, um, not only to grow in a very authentic way, uh, but also it, it brings everybody into the common ground or into the public realm where everybody belongs. Um, so here's a good side-by-side -side between the built environment as a space and the built environment used by the community and the people. Uh, we have now started to measure with an app and also created a booklet to teach people how they can pop up themselves. So, you know, I'm, I'm closing it out with just saying, remember that as urban planners, um, we can tap into our, um, I wanna say feminine side, and think of spaces, how we make places more active with actually engaging the people. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is going to be Lori Cox on the presentation of Power Her to the People, Revolutionary Self-Care. Hi, everybody. Can you see and hear me? Um, Hi, I'm Lori Cox, and I'm happy to be speaking here with you today, but I first want to open with a moment of gratitude to you. Time is a gift, and how you spend your time is precious. So first, I want to thank you for being here, listening, and sharing your energy with us, and I'm just honored to be here with the other speakers that are here. Um, I think I'm, my slides are not advancing. Oh, there we go. Ta-da. Thank you um, for being here. And um, as planners, I want to just celebrate you for a minute because you answered a call. What we do is not just a job. Um, what we do is technical, it's grueling, but it's also spiritual work. And so um, it's diverse and it's ever-changing. And um, you have chosen to do work that impacts the built natural, economic, and societal fabric for the better. So I wanted to give you gratitude and I hope that you give yourself gratitude for that as well. 
And I want to, to transition um, quickly about me. I'm a certified planner with 20 years of experience in transportation, environmental, economic, and resiliency planning. I'm a first generation college graduate and I love this industry, but I almost left because um, my story is not uncommon to many women. Um, I could not find the support that I needed to be a woman, a professional, and a mother in a very male-defined industry and economy. So um, I was not I was not uncommon to many other women. Two point million women left the labor force from 2019 to 2020. And I was almost there, but what I decided to do was add to my skills as a planner and also become a certified health and life coach to try to benefit the industry and help other women who are struggling like me figure out how to make this work, how to make the work-life balance happen and how to show up as our best and our brightest selves without having to carve pieces of ourselves off. So what I wanted to point out is that um, being woman is not only biological, but it's cultural. So things that we need to understand is that we are in a very male dominated work life but we have, um, as, as well, not just females, but anybody who is working under the estrogen hormonal cycle experiences this. So, you know, even our trans friends, I don't want to exclude them, but the estrogen hormonal cycle, we have points in our monthly cycle as well as our life that change. And unless we understand that, the cultural side of being a woman where a lot of the culture around us is um, we have, you know, the, the messaging is, is that we have to be perfect. And the things that we do as women um, bearing children and the, the hormonal cycle around that um, is some sort of weakness or liability. And that's just absurd. We are still professionals, we are still knowledgeable creatures, but we have to be recognized that there are hormonal issues that happen that um, may cause um, inconsistencies in how we perform that are not liabilities that, that just need to be recognized. And so um, that's why I wanted to point this out now is that throughout our cycle, um, in throughout our menstruating years, um, there is a cycle that does not marry up with the traditional nine to five schedule that is um, actually based on a testosterone model. And the testosterone model is, uh, it completes itself in 24 hours. So that's fine if, you know, there's part of the day where um, somebody who is testosterone oriented um, is, um, has a, a low point. Um, but for us, we have probably six days where there's some sort of instability that can also include low energy, trouble con concentrating, mood um, instabilities. Um, and then there's the cultural side that um, we're, we have this expectation of being perfect. And that's obviously, it's not fair to us, but um, it's also, um, if you have these periods and you're trying to compete in a cycle that um, is built on a testosterone model, then you, we have um, a lot of women who experience insecurities and try to mask that or um, overcompete um, but mask that and maybe, you know, like trying to make themselves feel better with eating or drinking or, you know, things that lead to um, <clears throat> lifestyle changes that are not uh, conducive to doing the work and being the people that we want to do because of this 
cultural uh, expectation that we not have these sort of cycles. Um, and that's just during our normal um, menstruating years, uh, uh, so to speak. But then you look at when women are about in their 40s, and I can speak to this myself, when estrogen levels start changing, then um, when they start declining, what starts happening is you start getting um, racing brain anxiety, depression, hot flashes that impact your ability to sleep. What are we doing at that time in our 40s? We are probably still raising children. We are probably taking care of our aging parents. And we're also trying to really ramp up in our careers and um, build up our retirement so that we can retire comfortably. There's a lot going on at that time that is not recognized by society and we are not giving ourselves the permission to tap into. And not many of us may not even have the knowledge that this is going on at all. We may think that there's just something wrong with us. It's just part of life. Our healthcare system is not really um, consistent enough and not educating enough to teach women about what is actually going on with us. So why I'm so passionate about self-care, um, not just from the, the mental standpoint, but also the physio physiological standpoint is because with understanding, we can create interventions help ourselves and not fall off track into negative bad habits or even like you know taking this out of the game we have so much value to offer to what we do like I said what we do as planners is not only technical but it's spiritual work you can't go into a community and actually feel what that community needs if you can't even tap into who you are as a person, if you are denying yourself what you need, which we all do, planners are typically like what we do, we're typically burning the midnight oil. And I know many of you out there have given up a weekend or an evening or time with your children because of the work that needs to be, be done because you know, like you're, you're passionate about getting that work done. But if you don't understand what your body needs, eventually your body is going to collapse. And that's what had happened to me. When I had my second child, I was trying to take care of a baby at night, take care of my other child who was uh, in middle school, work a full 40, do my extracurricular stuff, I'm trying to run, 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 run. And then my body was like, ah, no, and full collapse. And that's when I was finally like smacked above, you know, in the face that you cannot escape your physiology. You cannot escape needing very specific things for your own, your own self-care. So what I'd like to point out is that we are the spark and we are the light. And we, if we are not taking care of ourselves, we cannot give our gifts to the world. And we cannot fully step into our power if we are constantly burning ourselves out. Yes, we can be effective, but if you come from a background of trauma, if you don't get into that, you can't be fully who you're supposed to be. If you don't understand that the system um, is patriarchal in its, in its definition, and that it is not built on a system that is conducive to what women need, you cannot step into your power. And so I, I want to speak that into the space is that we are the spark and we are the light, but we cannot be that if we do not take care of ourselves if we do not understand the very specific and unique needs that women have as biological creatures and the cultural paradigm that is working against us, you know, to no disrespect to men, because I, 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 I love men. I 
fully acknowledge that men need self-care, but our economic system, our work life is designed on the male model. And that is like trying to teach a fish to climb a tree. We can't do it. And so when I talk about self-care is revolutionary, when we as women understand what we need, we fully step into our power, we are freaking unstoppable. We have the ability to make life in our DNA, whether we do or don't, or whether we choose to or not, whatever, but we have the ability to create life in our DNA. And that is magic right there. And it is time for us to pour from a full cup, not a cup that is, you know, like we can do a lot even when we're exhausted. And that's, that's one thing, but when we fill our own cup first, like Emily Hannah talked about, like she schedules time for herself. That is paramount because when you pour from a full cup, you have so much more to give. You can walk into those communities. You can feel what people need. You can stand up for yourself and you can stand up for others. And that is life-changing for many people. When you spark their interest and you show them the way from a full cup and from your own beaming self-fulfilled self, that's revolutionary. And so in terms of techniques for self-care, I have many, I, I coach people on this. These are some of the basics, but the first thing that one needs to understand, especially women, is that whole concept of putting your own mask on first before you put on the mask of others. And it's so hard for us. It's so hard for me and I had to learn it. I had to have somebody smack me over the face to tell me like, your kids are important, but you cannot put them first. You have to put your own mask on first. And culturally we are not we are not taught this. We are told that it is selfish. It is self-interested, but literally, if you can't help yourself, how can you help other people? You are only modeling for other people that exhaustion is the way, that burning the candle at both ends is the way, that being the lesser part of yourself is the way, or being the version of somebody else that somebody else put on you is the way. So what I'd like to leave us with is in terms of self-care, I would love for you to understand the concept of nourishment, nourishing your mind, body, and spirit. There is no specific diet that can actually nourish you because it doesn't understand you. There is no system that can nourish what you need, like you need. I can tell you that there's some basics. We all need to learn how to breathe, breathing deep, because when you're stressed out, you literally do not have access to your prefrontal cortex, which is the problem solver, the organizer, mostly where planners exist. Um, for the technical stuff, but also like solving for your own life. When you are stressed, take a moment to breathe. Breathe into your body, breathe into your soul. And feel that the oxygen is what your body needs move more too. We don't move enough. We're at our computers. We're like this. We're on our phones. We're like this. We're on, you know, move more. It doesn't have to be some sort of specific workout routine. P90X, nobody, if, God love you if you like P90X, but it, it really turns most people off. Just move, take a walk, go out in the sunshine. Honestly, the sun is one of our, you know, it is our greatest source of energy and we don't, there enough we get through the, the windows or you know like through the window of a car running from building to building um drink water this is this is easy but not easy like i do spend a lot of my day drinking coffee i'm not gonna say i'm perfect but 
the more water we drink, it, it cleans our cells. It, it helps everything function right. When your body is functioning right, you have the ability to tap into other things because you're not distracted by that. Your brain functions better. Um, in terms of diet, you know, there's like keto, there's all sorts of things out there to tell you like what you should eat to lose weight. Don't even worry about that. The last thing I want for women to focus on is being smaller, be bigger, be as big as you can, um, in energy and in spirit and in intellect in your voice. Um, but in terms of how to eat for your body, eat the rainbow eat colorful, colorful fruits and vegetables because that is literally sunshine. Every color uh, um, in the fruits and vegetables that we eat is metabolized sunshine. It's just a wavelength of sunshine. Red peppers, it's a wavelength of sunshine. Eat that, it's going to fuel your body and your body is going to fuel you. Your body is your experiential vessel. And if your body is not well, your brain is not well, your spirit is not well, it's just part of the system. So prioritize that. You are number one. And then everybody else learns from you. Um, and sleep more. This is a hard one for me. And I joke that my whole family were vampires, but um, our energetic cycle is if we're up past 10, Kids and I will be up for hours and it's not cool with, you know, the normal eight or nine to five, whatever cycle, but however you can break up your day, sleep as much as you can, because that's when you actually um, integrate information. That's when your brain has the ability to play freely. That's when your cells clean themselves and we deprive ourselves of sleep, especially Americans. We deprive ourselves of sleep. Um, like it's some sort of badge of honor. Like I was, I only got three hours of sleep. Da, 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 da. It's, it, it's biologically, it's not um, conducive to the life that we really want. And when you talk about um, the, the cycles of estrogen, um, sleep issues can impact that. And in our forties with them in, um, one of the things that I have experienced is that it's harder and harder for me to sleep. And what has come out of that is in a conversation with my gynecologist who I love her, I would recommend her to anybody get the good health care. She talked about declining estrogen also lead to anxiety, depression, and sleeplessness. Um, so I would highly recommend if you are experiencing that, don't ignore it because it is going to impact your efficacy in all the things that you love. And it's going to diminish the quality of your life. And your life is as important and as valuable as anybody else's. So get the care that you need. If those things are happening and you cannot sleep at night, you have racing brain, go figure out why. Get that care that you need. It is not cool to not sleep at night. Um, and that leads me to my next point. Connect with yourself. Make it a point. Schedule it. Spend time with you. If you cannot make time to meditate, which is, is hard for me, I've got kids on me, I've got work, you know, all that Spend time and mindfulness. Connect with yourself being mindful of things that you love, checking in with your body. Your body will tell you what you need. If you have pain, if you have um, irritation, your body will tell you what you need. And if you don't spend time checking in like, hey, body, like I said, our bodies are experiential vessels what we have 13 million points of information that come in from our body and our feelings. And we have, we can't go even three seconds without having a thought. If we are not spending time with that, we are going to become a victim to it. And our bodies will crash when we ignore them for too long. 
So make it a point to connect with yourself. I like to do stoplights. Every stoplight on my way to work, there are things like at least three to five things that I can connect with myself. How do I feel? How's my thought pattern? What am I grateful about? And that's when I also want to talk about practicing gratitude. Practicing gratitude is like meditation on steroids because then what we focus on, the mind creates. So if we are focused on what is miserable, what we don't like, the mind will create more of that. If we focus on what we are grateful for and what can we can be grateful for the mind will create more of that and there's the law of attraction if you want to look into that abraham hicks if you're not familiar abraham hicks is an experience but um what if we practice gratitude the idea is that we align ourselves with more of the things that we want versus the things that we don't want and i want that for you every person here that is spending this time with us I love you and you have value and I want to help you and nourish you to be the biggest and brightest force in the world. You are intellectual, you are technical and you are spiritual creatures and you need to be your strongest, most self-actualized and um, most brilliant versions of yourself. And so I will, I will leave you with that. Um, and thank you so much again for spending your time with us i know it's the dinner hour so again from my heart to yours thank you for being here thank you so much Lori, for um being the last presenter on the panel here tonight and already as you were kind of uh wrapping up some of your last comments you already had a number of questions come in for those who have been in the uh in the audience here tonight so i would invite all of our panelists to turn back uh our our cameras on so that we can answer some of the questions that are coming into the q a section right now so our first question um is did the apa salary survey also evaluate respondents by race and ethnicity if yes what were the results so Heather, I think that might be directed a little bit more toward you. Yes. Um, so even though I didn't address it per se in what I was speaking on, if anyone wants to look further into the link um, to that APA salary survey, there is a table further down um, on the summary section that does give information on a bit of the gender data that was collected. Um, well, it's not a large difference, a gap in salary does exist by race. It separated out the data on those who are considered white versus those who are considered not white. Those that are white, it is about $4,000 higher than those who indicated that they're a race other than white. Thank you so much, Heather. In fact, our next question is still very much in line with salary and asking for what you're worth. And I want to quote exactly, Heather, something you said with the very beginning of your presentation. I wrote it down here because it was really powerful. You said, fight for what we are deserving of and be our own cheerleader. And so that goes in line with the next question here. Is there a right time to ask for a raise? And are there tips to negotiating that? Because it's always that uncomfortable conversation is, I know I deserve it, but how do I broach a subject? You know, what is the first step that you would take? Uh, you know, I see Emma, you're shaking your head, you're going exactly like this, and you know, across the board. So I would love to hear from each of you too, because I think we would each approach it a little bit differently based on who we work with, whether it's public or private sector. So. Uh, playing uh, Hollywood Squares here. I'm gonna go with Emily over here and then we'll go to Cheryl, then we'll go to Lori, and then we'll go over here to uh, to Heather uh, on, on the top right. So Emily, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Raquel. So my suggestion for when is the right time to ask for a salary is I think when it starts impacting you and you're, you don't think that you can comfortably maintain your life right now with the way that increased in inflation or whatever your situation is, have that on honest conversation with your boss if you have that relationship with them or even your HR director. 
Um, so I had some issues in Castleberry as I was being promoted. I negotiated for my salary originally, but as many of us know, as you move up the ranks internal to a city or county government, they don't quite give you what an external candidate coming in could potentially be. It's a percentage of what you're currently making, not necessarily um, what's kind of out there as that standard. So do your homework, kind of that first tip that I provided on, that, um, on the professional side was do your research. So when the city was creating a chief planner position for me, they didn't have a, a planner that was in a supervisory role at the city. It was, it was like director or senior planner, right? There's nobody in between. So they created that position for that advancement for me internally. And they tried to give me a salary that was just a, a small percentage increase. And I was like, no, chief planners really make this. And I went well out of my way to find other job descriptions, other examples of other uh, chief planner roles and brought that back to the city. And I was able to negotiate a higher salary. On the flip side of that, I want to real quickly, when I negotiated my salary for bike walk, that was a totally different conversation because that is not a government entity. And that is not how a nonprofit operates. Nonprofits operate a little differently. And I knew that because I did my homework work. Um, so also know who your organization is, know what that general salary range is for your role and others that you are seeking. And don't be afraid to just generally have those conversations because it helps your bosses and your employers know that that's what you're looking for in the future. And as a uh, manager and as somebody that hires staff, it is a lot less expensive to pay somebody more money to keep them happy than it is to find right, somebody new train them and get them up to speed, especially at the Mach 5 we seem to be at today with our world. So that would be my suggestions for uh, anyone that's interested in going after that salary increase. Cheryl, we'll go with you next. Sure, um, I have to agree with Emily on that. And one of the things I've done in my current job is I actually uh, set myself a meeting with my supervisor quarterly to just go over like where I am with my projects, my process, and I spell it out for them on paper. And then when it comes to the performance evaluation, I actually pre-prep like how many projects I've done this year, how many people did I impact with my projects? I give them statistics of mm -hmm. how my projects were beneficial. Obviously I'm working with the community. So I have to prove every single time that what I'm doing is worth it because I even, I work in a position that's made up for what I do. So, you know, as a public realm director, there's only three of us in the US. <laughs> New York's trying to establish one. And so when you are like cutting through something that doesn't exist, you have to really not just do the homework Emily's saying, but constantly show the metrics of why your work is worth it and why you're worth to be kept and why other people might want you. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Don't be afraid, I would say, ever to stand your ground and say, like, this is what I want, not only because of what I need, but because I am so good at it. And, and be, you know, have the force to admit it. Like, there's nothing wrong with saying that. Uh, people do that all the time. And I think one of the things that helps also is showing that you have no fear to ask. If you are timid about asking or not putting yourself out there in terms of, like, this is what I need or want, um, no one will ever know. And so uh, don't wait for your bosses to tell you, oh, I'm going to give you a raise. Uh, actually, just knock at the door and, and put a meeting in their calendar and go for it. Laura, we'll go to you next. It's hard to follow these two goddesses. Um, I will say, I will, I will echo that doing your research is very important. Um, but also remembering that you are making your employer money, mm -hmm. especially in the private sector, you are making your employer money and you are carrying the ball for them. So you have value. And that's something that I think women need to understand um, at, at a cellular, cellular level. So, so um, the right time for you to ask for a raise is one when you need it like economically, if you are struggling and you need it, absolutely. Um, you should not be underpaid. You should not be worrying about life because you can't do your job effectively. I think setting these 
um, benchmarks and um, quarterly, like Cheryl was saying, definitely go in um, and put it to them. What do I need to do to earn the money that I need if, that, if that's not right there? And also doing the work internally to tap into your fear around asking the question, because a lot of women have that. A lot of women have that insecurity. Um, I'm a single parent. And one of the most empowering thoughts that I have brought on is I am not a single mother, I am head of household. And I give that to other single mothers because it's been vilified. It's in our DNA to think that we are some sort of weakness as mothers, especially single mothers. No, I am head of household. If my <laughs> ship sinks, the whole ship sinks. And so that is empowering for me to go in and be like, listen, uh, you know, you're dealing with mama bear. So I need the money to take care of these kids and I have a right and a privilege to it. So I would say definitely doing the deep work of why there's fear around asking for the money that we need. And I think if more of us do this, we will change that pay gap if we do the deep work of understanding the fear that goes into asking that question, we will change that curve. So that's my, my two cents. Heather, any other remarks that you'd like to add to on this question? Candidly, I don't think there's too much I can really add, especially just saying all three of them have so much um, great inspiration, motivation, great points on this topic. Um, it's something that I'm still gaining more experience in, I will say. And I keep a lot of these things in mind and just, it's a constant everyday practice, making sure that you say you keep handy those little things where it comes out that, wow, great job. That way when something comes up and and, you know, maybe something you can easily bring up, you can also pull out of your back pocket, look where I really did great, look where I dominated, look where I really wowed people and went that extra mile. Just always mm -hmm. remember your worth, even if it isn't the time to actually make a request at that certain moment. I want to make sure that we get thank you heather for those remarks get through all the questions here but i leave you with two words to close out this particular topic because i know this is always a very sensitive topic but the two words i leave you with regard to this is manage up right manage up and let people know your worth to the point where it's not too late because if you're waiting to the point where it's too late it's too late right um and so something that i do from my perspective as well here at beef I actually created a, a diary of accomplishments that I've done because by the time you're looking for a raise and you're looking to go to the table to ask for more money, we've all been there. What have I done? And when you're put under the pressure of figuring out what have you done since you've been here while you're going to the table, it's too late. And you, you know, we're, we, it also gives us the ability to celebrate your success. I think that's one of the things we fail to do as women. And yes, I will use the word fail because we're so hard on ourselves, but keep a diary of your success because that helps you as a person, but that also helps you at the time when you go to the table to go back. And, you know, there have been times that I've even looked at this diary and even our level of marketing activity activities and said, holy insert expletive, look at what we've done, right? <laughs> and so it, it's also a great pat on the back, but that also helps you go to the table uh, when the time is right to ask for that salary. Uh, next question here is how do you balance, I love this question, how do you balance being a woman and accepting your self-care without harming your reputation with men? This was a very interesting one. And uh, Lori, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, because you know you actually brought up a very good point. You are head of household. You are not a single mom. So how do you balance you know that being a woman in the workforce and being head of household? Being very vocal about my priorities. Um, I don't fall down on my work duties, but I do make very hard choices. That listen, I need to take a personal day because my kids are sick, or I am just I have not slept. I, I need to sleep. Um, I almost, like I said, almost left the profession because I was in a private sector firm that I felt like I had to fight for that. But I, I, I 
told them like, listen, I cannot do more. Mm -hmm. And I think more of us need to say that without thinking that it's something wrong with us. We are literally like, especially rearing children. I tell people it's like the most uh, delicate war. Mm -hmm. You're going to war. You are sleepless. <laughs> your, your identity <laughs> is changing. You may not have eaten or showered in days. And you're supposed to like go to work. Like I was look good at it, look good while doing it, right? I know. <laughs> and like my body is supposed to bounce back to whatever. Like here, there are so many unrealistic expectations put on us as women that we have got to start fighting back. I was pumping in closets and in my car, like trying to nurse my child and home at home. Like in America, we we do have a big problem with trying to marry the worlds of work and parenting and child rearing for men and women. But for women, it is, it is a humongous experience. And the majority of the time is uh, from the zero to at least five years is on the woman. It just is. Um, even like in Freudian psychology, like all the psychological development is mostly oriented to mom. And so like, we have to be vocal about it and be confident that I am not less of a professional. My, I, I can still do my work, but there needs to be recognition that I am not a robot. So I don't know if there's ever really a balance because like, there's never going to be harmony. Like there's always going to be more attention, but both jobs are equally important. Um, even like uh, hopefully delivering a panel to the Florida Planning Conference on childcare and how it is not a public service. And that is, is such an issue of equity, especially for women in, in lower income, low wage households. Um, we need to recognize that. And until we get bold about it, until we start speaking up and being like, listen, there's only so much that is possible. Um, it's not going to happen. And, and honestly, like part of the change happened for me when I was still trying to run, 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 run. And my body was like, nope. Mm -hmm. And it broke. Mm -hmm. And I was like sobbing in the laundry, like, <laughs> um, and until we stop that habit of denying our biology, denying our demands, being bold about what we need, our, our, there's not going to be even the recognition from our employers. We have to speak up. You bring up a really good point about self-awareness. It's a lot easier to have that level of self-awareness, that level of confidence that Emily talked about when you have people you can relate to, you know, and so I listened to you, Lori, about how you felt alone. You didn't feel the support in a male-defined industry. And I definitely want to give a hats off. I looked at a, a couple of the attendees, hats off to the guys who were joining us tonight. <laughs> You know, it's not, it, it's very rare we get, you know, you know, silent applause for everybody um, that we get that level of support. So I just want to just take a quick moment just to say thank you to the guys joining us on the call, because you are part of helping create that support network that enables women to have that level of power, right, in the workplace, especially, especially with regard to the planning industry. And it definitely leads us to our next question is, do you have any tips of forming partnerships so we don't feel alone in this male-defined industry? How do you find those groups in the community and how do you get involved in them? And I, I leave this open to anybody who wants to weigh in on, on that uh, because I know each and every single one of us are, are involved in each of our communities in a different way. I'll go ahead and start this one off and take the reins. Um, sometimes it's hard to really find others and connect, but I am grateful that Roxanne, who I think I saw she's here tonight. Um, she, back in spring of 2020, after there had been much conversation about we should have this women in planning group in the Orlando area, she reached out and gathered some people that were interested in it, kicked it off and started getting us going. It was right when COVID was going on where a lot more people more often felt 
alone, like they didn't have others to reach out to. And you miss that human interaction when so many were working from home. Um, mm -hmm. So Roxanne got this group started. And then I ended up taking over leadership of the group. And I have found actually a great partner in crime, Heather Erweiler, who I think is here tonight as well. And we just try to make things as much so that people know about the group as possible, but also try to get out there and see what other people are doing. I know um, we made some great connections, had some awesome discussions when we attended an event from WTS Central Florida, which is Women in Transportation Seminar, just, I think it was back in January or February. And that was incredibly helpful for working on this event tonight actually and we're looking forward to trying to partner with them and actually for tonight's event i reached out to connections and partnered with say suncoast edi committee it couldn't have happened with all these different organizations coming together with great um, ideas resources i met cheryl actually because of this um, she was a suggestion from someone that was helping to um, put this event together. So really it comes down to networking is an amazing and powerful tool always. You never know when you might need to use your connections, which sounds negative, but also they may very well need to use you. It's really, there's just immense power in working with others, even if you don't work in the same region, you can share mm -hmm. ideas, you can share um, different things that you may be doing. And with the Orlando Women in Planning Group, it's been hard with it being, it's such a big region um, and just with COVID. So we've been regularly doing monthly Zoom meetings, but we're hoping to do more in-person meetings, especially as we're getting more comfortable with getting out and about. Um, we've done two meetups so far, try to get around the different areas of Orlando and reach everyone as much as we can. Um, if, I, if anyone through, I did put information in the chat as well as about the other support groups in this um, that have helped out with this event. And I'd love to talk more about it, but I know we only got so much time. <laughs> If, if I can jump in real quick on top of what Heather was saying, one of the one of the things my suggestion would be for if you're looking for someone to just talk to, just start with one person and go have coffee. Mm -hmm. um, start with somebody maybe that's in your organization and just connect with them. I think just opening up and having those conversations is, is important. In Castlebury at the time that I worked there, there was a lot of women, young and old, been there for 20 years and then here for a couple years. And we had a, a boss at the time who was male and very dominant and did not give a crap about the women and the issues that were going on in the office. Um, and so we met for dinner one night, talked about the issues, put a game plan together to go to the city manager and the commission to talk about those issues. And he is no longer employed at the city of Castleberry. So don't let the, don't let just your voice or someone else's voice go astray connect with the people in your workplace or within your profession and, and use that to help support each other because more voices are much better than just your single voice, but don't, doesn't matter. Your single voice is still powerful enough. So um, just some suggestions. Cheryl and Lori, any other comments on this? Um, I just want to jump in and um, so did anybody see the, the Liza Minnelli and Lady Gaga? Mm -hmm women supporting women that's what we need whatever industry we're in whatever you know we have been pitted against each other for a long time i don't know how i can't point to what but the whole like cat fight you know what we can understand what we need and we can support each other so a rising tide rises all boat boats mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. like i really want to just celebrate that we can help each other and we should. Um, and that's the only time, the only way that we're actually gonna turn the tide on patriarchy and create an equitable world for men and women in all spaces. 
I'm just going to add one thing, which is if you do a host events, uh, two things that I have done is create events where people can bring their children. So mm -hmm. city gathering is just called picnic outside. And, um, you know, you can bring your kids and there's more kids for kids to play with. And also when you send out invites, um, I've asked planners and architects to bring their wives or daughters or like family. Um, and we also host a, uh, there's two other things we host a bit is uh, bourbon sprawl, which is a nerdy urbanist, uh, like happy hour, but we do it at a cafe so that if you come with your family, you can be there even though, you know, you can get some bourbon on the side uh, and we'll do it right after work. Uh, so it's, it's a bit like these family friendly things um, actually help a lot. And um, online, I do um, host some thing called Cafecito with Placemaking X and Placemaking Florida and US. And it's just an open like coffee hour from your screen um, but that kind of like equalizes, again, these times of days, days of the week, weekends, like choosing the right time and, and the right atmosphere so that everybody's included. I think we should all start something in these groups, right? These, these partnerships that we have. Uh, and maybe it's just a, you know, an hour at the start of the week or the end of the week to celebrate, hey, here's what I'm going to conquer this week. Here was my win from last week, right? So you need to identify this is what I'm going to conquer as a woman, put on your She-Ra costume and <laughs> conquer the week, right? And, but then celebrate your win because I don't think we do that enough as women, right, across the board. Uh, in closing out just this, this particular topic, uh, I think for me, one of the things that's really helped in developing partnerships, I actually look for women that are unrelated to the industry that I'm involved in. Uh, because I find that, you know, so often we work in these silos and what defines us in our job and it, it identifying with women in different industries beyond what I'm focused in allows me to have a more worldly picture on how I fit in, into this universe, right? Um, <laughs> I can tell you my, my network of women actually probably only a handful actually fall within this space. A lot of them fall within different areas like doctors, um, you know, uh, regional mobility planners, of course, you know, being that we're with, uh, you know, an autonomous vehicle industry. But I, I like to have a network of women that I can say, hey, how's it going? And then now you just, you realize there's so much overlap, even though we work in different industries, right? And I think that creates that unified um, uh, partnership that we're all looking for, even if we don't have the same job. Um, back to a question here about raises. Uh, what if you ask for a raise? I love this question. And the answer is no. And to borrow a phrase from Emily, and I'm going to shamelessly steal amazing stuff. It's not no now, it's maybe later, right? So how do you, um, how do you ask for a raise? And the answer is no, but then still maintain that good relationship with your supervisor to make sure that it's not awkward because it's the, oh, I guess we weren't on the same page, but then how do you develop that ability to be on the same page? So uh, leave it to one of you ladies to, to jump on this question. I'm gonna jump from personal experience. <laughs> That's, I love those kind of experiences, right? So, <laughs> so um, well, two things. Um, one, never, ever, ever burn any bridge. Doesn't matter what that bridge looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes it's just not the right time period. And also like, maybe it is something that's telling you that it's, it, it could be time to move on to something else. So don't always think like, oh, I got to stay here. I got to get stuck in this one job and wait till I go up the ladder. And that's all like, to me, old rhetoric. Um, sometimes you have, you have, you have to put the value on yourself by moving on, but I would say none of this, I never take it personally. Um, it just might not be the right fit. Um, and it, if, if it is, you can still renegotiate later. So I've had all those situations happen to me in private and public sector, and I'm not gonna name names because that's too <laughs> personal, but I, I have quit and I have also renegotiated salaries in a future you know, moment in time. Uh, so everything's possible. Anybody else can talk from personal experience. I love personal experience stories because I think a lot of people identify those with those. 
I, I would just echo what Cheryl said 100%. Like, it's not a personal conversation. It's personal to you, but you are an economic unit. You make money for your employer. You, you run the ball for them. You have value. You are not coming in, like, asking, like, Oliver Twist for more. Like, you are asking for what you need to do your job for them. So don't be afraid of that. It's not a personal conversation. I had one the other day, um, like, this is what I feel I should be at. And can we do this? How can we do this? If we can't do this, then don't be afraid to look elsewhere because mm -hmm. you are not tied to one employer anymore. And very, it's very true. It's old rhetoric. We are not in that time anymore. And we, we shouldn't have to jump, but that is the only way to teach our employers that they need to change their ways. If we have to jump, if they can't meet your needs, you don't have to diminish your needs. It's not okay. And one quick personal story to add on top of that, and I, I'm not sure if this is best practice, if I would recommend this, but this was a strategy that I took to get the raise that I felt like I deserved. So I was a planner one um, and was doing planner, senior planner tasks, um, and I found that in the job description. And so I went to my boss and I said, I feel like it's time I'm doing that work. Here's the examples of that work. And he said, no. Um, and so I explained and I asked, well, when, and he's like, well, you need to do this, this, and this in the job description for the planner two job that I did not have. And so I documented that I waited patiently. And then I brought that information to him. And when he still said, no, I took it then to HR. I didn't write, just stop at my supervisor. Um, I, I went a little bit further because I wanted to say, well, is there a reason why he's saying no? And the HR director explained to me that and again, I was a baby planner, that there's a budget season for that type of stuff. And that the time in which I asked was right when we adopted our new budget. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't aware. So I waited patiently and I understood, but sometimes just having that dialogue too, if they say no, oftentimes then ask why, is it a budgetary constraint? Are there more resources that they need? Um, being a bike walk now, being a nonprofit, I'm very resource strapped. I do, I have to fundraise for any of the money that we spend, right? We're a nonprofit. So, so any of the resources that I need, I need to know from staff right away so that I can go find that. I might not be able to give them a raise that they want now, but let me go fundraise because now I know what that's your intention. And so sometimes just having those conversations is just starting that next step. It might be no, but it's not no forever. Mm -hmm. I think that goes back to, and then Heather, I'll let you weigh in here on the last comments. It's, it's not a no, maybe later. So then how do you identify the later? And then maybe a follow-up question is if they say no, what can I do to make sure that we can revisit this conversation at a better time that aligns with the company's objectives, my objectives as well, to make you understand the value that I bring to this company, right? Um, timeliness is everything, as we know, right? And, and Emily, you brought up a, a great point. This is not something that you just naturally wake up and think, I'm going to ask for a race today. Like, that's not how it works, right? Like, you have to build your case and then strike while the iron's hot, know when the iron's hot, know when you have that flexibility and the opportunity to do that. Um, Mother, don't know if you have any last comments here. No, um, I was just going to echo definitely what was said. Um, I 100% would say, if the answer is no, what can we do to get to that yes, or get to a happy medium, maybe a compromise that works us in the direction of what I would like, what I think I am worth, and what my end goal is, and definitely why. And perhaps you may learn a very valid reason, such as mm -hmm. Emily said, budget. Don't realize sometimes oh, wait, this isn't the right time to consider that. We just adopted this budget, but let's plan this into the next year's budget or, you know, see what we can do. Absolutely. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left here and we have three questions. So we're going to go rapid fire here. Um, so I'm going to add the next three questions here and then I'll, I'll let each, uh, I'll let one of you answer them so that we can make sure we get everybody out on time. Uh, and again, thank you for spending your evening with us. So I uh, don't know who wants to take this one, but what would you say to a beginning planner? Someone used the words baby planner uh, who wants to start to work their way up. 
I guess I'll take this one um, real quick. My advice would be um, be driven, be dedicated and know your stuff. Immediately hit the books, learn your code, learn what your trade is and ask the questions. Ask your planners that are around you, ask your network that might be outside of your existing organization, but just try to just absorb, be a sponge. And then when you feel comfortable and when you have the ability, start interjecting your feedback, your opinion, your comments based on your education and your knowledge of the code, because then you become much more valuable valuable as you start to pick up the um, amount of information and the amount in which that you say. Um, so I would definitely suggest that. I would also suggest being a part of network organizations. Um, as I kind of started, I founded the planning, the Urban Night Student Organization at UCF. And part of that foundation of that planning organization was bringing in technical expertise into the classroom. So as a graduate student, I was engaging with our planning profession bringing those professionals into the classroom for them to teach site plan review, resume building, negotiation skills, among other things. So I had a robust network as I started my planning career. Um, as Cheryl said, never burn a bridge. You have no idea mm -hmm. that you might go work for them in the future, or they might work for you. Definitely had that happen. Um, so always just keep that smile on your face, keep pounding payment and working really hard at your profession if this is something that you want to do long term and move up through. Um, and then, like I said, always ask. Don't be afraid to ask mm -hmm. those questions. I would say that that's probably the biggest way that I was able to learn uh, and raise up through the ranks from a baby planner. Um, so I went from planner one to development services manager in less than four years because I asked the right questions. I was very knowledgeable and I was not afraid to speak up and say my opinion. Awesome. And Cheryl, this next question is for you. I love the involvement of uh, grandmothers in your work. Did you already have a relationship with them? How did you convince them to work with you? And what did that mean for the community? So grannies are awesome. <laughs> I did not know them. I had no relationship to this uh, project or village or anything at all. Um, I think the biggest deal is um, we're used to doing surveys and questions in a very like dogmatic manner. And the way I approach them is, well, first, when I scoped out the village, I saw that they would huddle in front of the church on a little like stoop area every like every afternoon, kind of after, like right before dinner. And so first I observed that they were grouping there and I just approached them and introduced myself and just started asking simple questions like, what's your favorite place in the village? Uh, where do you go to on a daily basis? Let's map this out. What's hard to walk through, et cetera. And then we started identifying like these older stories of what was your favorite thing that you ever did when you, you first lived here? And so that's how the bread story was found. Uh, but it truly is just going to them and dialoguing with them very openly and not asking, you know, things like, um, so if we were going to rebuild this town, <laughs> you know, cause it's like, there's something wrong with my town. You know, you don't wanna offend people you don't know by assuming that they want something different. And so asking them about their memories of place or things that they love, you can really find a deeper meaning in the past that can be re revived to the future. And so that's, that's how I convinced them to uh, work with us even though at the beginning they thought I was crazy and they were like, why would you even come here and do this for us? Uh, but as the days went by, it's like I became one with the village and uh, that's part of the project is like persistence and um, being very open and very humble and not being very careful with questions, not attributing mm -hmm. answers like before you even ask them. Awesome, thank you, Cheryl. And last question we have here before we close out the session. Uh, any mini mind mode you decide on yourselves is going to answer this last one, but as a woman who is also a manager, do you think there's anything different you do than men you may have previously worked for? I guess I'll take that one. Um, being a manager, one of the things that I had to deal with in emerging and creating bike walk and, and help building staff was one of my assistant executive director um, went on maternity leave and we didn't have a policy. We didn't support it, couldn't pay her. It was, it was pretty sad. 
Um, and, and she took three months off um, unpaid. And I, I we, like I said, didn't have anything. So now our board is having those conversations as to how do we support maternity leave for women? Um, because at the city or other places that I was employment, we didn't have maternity leave. That was not something that we provided. You had to take your personal paid vacation and all of it, if you really wanted all that time off. And then obviously you wouldn't have any vacation to use thereafter. Um, so that was something that we realized at Bike Walk pretty early on. And, um, and now we're looking at creating that policy. Now, obviously paid maternity leave, it's expensive. I'm continuing to pay an employee for three months without them providing services. And for a nonprofit, that's really difficult to do, especially because a lot of our programs are reimbursable or grant related. Um, and so I have to show direct costs on the back end. Um, but, but knowing that that's something that our organization wants to support, we can build up a reserve and administration fund, if you will, to help support that, that maternity time. Um, but I know that, like I said, just knowing from, from a male perspective and the bosses that have had, they would have never thought to try to include that in an organization or think about how to support their staff on maternity leave. Because I wasn't able to do that for my employee, what I was able to do, she's working part-time for me as the executive assistant uh, for me, but I was able to work in um, paid time off for a part-time employee. So though I did not give her maternity leave, I'm giving her paid time off um, on a pretty a regular basis so that she can be with her children. Um, I'm also providing a flexible schedule for her so that she only works really early in the morning and really late in the evening. And she has the chunk of her day to spend with her four-year-old and two-year-old because this is the pivotal parts of their life that they're kind of learning and emerging and growing. The other thing that I try to do with all my staff, and this includes contract staff as well as children can come to meetings. I often encourage that. If you don't have a babysitter, don't worry, pop them in the corner. We got stuff for them to play with and I'll go get donuts down the street. Um, being that supportive for your work, whatever that might look like, um, is truly important, again, to, to keep staff there, to keep them happy, but also think about progressively how your staff is going to change over time. I have staff currently that are married that are thinking about kids. So in the next couple of years, that's something that we as Bike Walk really need to think about as if that's a policy we want to have or not. Um, so I would say that that's a, that's a big takeaway. Flexible schedule is the other thing that, that we took away and have implemented pretty regularly at Bike Walk. We don't, we say we work a nine to five, but we work all hours. Um, and, and that's to allow for that personal life to, to happen because we know there are doctor's appointments for kids and there are meetings that you have to go with your husband or things that you have to do for your life. And that's okay. You can have that flexibility in your schedule. Not everybody allows that. That's that transformational type of leadership and manager style. Um, I hope that more employers, especially coming out of COVID, lean in that direction, knowing that the work is still getting done, but their employees are essentially happy. And now women have a much better work-life balance and are incredibly more happy to come to work and oftentimes bring the passion and the creativity for which you hired them for. So try mm. to promote that as best you can. The passion by which you hire them for. That is a great way to end. So thank you, Emily. And I'll leave you with a couple last words before I toss it over to Heather to close us out. But know your value, know your worth, know yourself, and know your power. Because there's no one who knows you better than you. And there's no one that's going to cheerlead for you better than yourself. Because if you don't look for, out for numero uno, no one is. And you are numero uno. Uh, the other thing I will say is thank you for creating a safe space today. Um, big kudos to all the panelists here and for Heather and Amy for putting this together because I think we all could use that safe space. Um, and I think the questions that were asked by tonight are evidence that we all are looking for that level of guidance for all of us to be a flashlight for others who may have you know, gone through those choppy waters before. Uh, and so it also serves as that ability to know that I'm not alone. Uh, and then I, and, and what I'm experiencing is not unique to me. Uh, and it's, it's encouraging to know that other people have also gone through the same thing. So Heather, uh, I'll let you close out here before we say goodnight. All righty. Thank you so much to everyone who has helped to get this put together. It was something that I knew I wanted to do an event and more than the little bit I did last year for Women's History Month. Um, I really love getting to work specifically with things um, to advocate for women, but also one of the things that drew me to planning initially was just being able to advocate for everyone, those who 
have equal opportunity and you know they're not seen as having any kind of a um lacking point or something pulling cool them back in life but really to be able to help with advocating for those who have special circumstances struggles or maybe are seen as lesser in society for various reasons um so things like this are just um amazing to be able to put together and try to get the word out and bring people together, make them more aware and really bring back that networking and that community element that is so important. I know it affected people a lot throughout COVID when they couldn't talk to people as much, see them face to face and it's really helped just to, I know, in our monthly Orlando Metro section women in planning groups, sometimes just be able to talk about general life, talk about things we deal with in the field, share ideas, inspiration, etc. And you can see here all of our contact information. I think we're all more than happy to talk further, answer any questions later on, um, and share any of the resources that we've talked about tonight and um, really let's build a Great. Well, thank you so much to everybody for joining and have a great night. I hope you're walking away tonight uh, feeling supported, feeling you have a level of new partnership and knowing, quite frankly, that you're just not alone <laughs> and what you're feeling is natural and that's okay. Uh, so have a great night. I hope to hear from some of you and enjoy the evening. Bye, everybody.